Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and kick this off. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Again, we got lots of snacks there, and uh, please uh, avail yourself of that. Um, our uh, Marianne will be here probably in a little while. Um, until there, and we'll we'll make it. Um, good to see everybody. Uh, thanks for, uh, for stepping up for me. I haven't been at the last two meetings, but I had one heck of a summer. Uh, I had a family member pass away and then a family member um, critically ill. Uh, both, uh, I was going to say both are okay. It's a 50% rate. One made it, the other didn't. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of joking. I know that doesn't sound like a joke, but um, a shout out to Hospice of the Valleys. Uh, who took the just the best care ever uh, of my mother who passed away in July and she went out like a champ. So, um, and then uh, shout out to my wife who gave such loving care during that time. She forgot to eat and drink and ended up in Darlene's wonderful care, okay, uh, uh, for about two or three days. Uh, but uh, uh, all, all is good now and I appreciate you guys stepping up for me. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take a uh, roll. Let's see here, just real quick. Wow, look who's first. County of Riverside District 3, are you here? Yeah. All right. Canyon Lake, are you here? No. Lake Elsinore? Yeah. All right, good to see you. Tell the gang at the, uh, back at the <clears throat> ranch, we said hi. All right, Menifee is sitting to my left. Always a pleasure to see Lisa. Murrieta is sitting to my right. Always a pleasure to see Rick. Of course, the song goes, clowns to the, anyway, I, I won't, because I can't, I can't consider Lisa, you know, I can't do it. I'm going downhill from there. I used to be a professional clown. Oh, oh, she used to be a professional clown, so I'm well in line. Okay, so if I call a clown here and a joker here, I'm good. Okay, uh, Mary Ann's on her way. Mr. Tim Walker from Wildemar. That's right. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, Susan Hapner or Kathy Zappia, Cancer Society, you guys here? Okay. Uh, we know we got our lovely people from Michelle's places here. Good to see you, Kim. Um, and where? where Maryland. And Maryland's there. Good to see you, too. Uh, Inland Empire Health Plan. Good to see you. Uh, Loma Linda University, are we here? Well, there you are. I thought I saw you. All right. Uh, Riverside University Health System. Hi. Scripps Health. Negative. All right. Um, Temecula Valley Hospital. Darlene is here. Menifee Valley Medical Center. Yes, sir. Good to see you. UC Riverside. Doc oh, okay. The, let's see. Dr. Michael Nduati. Are you here, Doc? No. Okay, so nobody here from UC Riverside School of Medicine. And let's see, UC San Diego Health. Okay, and local doctors, uh, Dr. Bremner. Where? Oh, good to see you. Uh, Richard Chinook. Doc. Dr. Horner. Good to see you as always. And uh, Dr. Uh, Kalra. Are you here, Doc? All right. Um, typically, we uh, always, oh, thank you. Dr. Evelyn Mendoza, are you here? How about Dr. Julia Schwenka? All right, that's roll call. Um, do we have any here for public comments, non-agenda comments? I didn't think so. We'll move over to committee uh, business. We always like to start off with our testimonials. And I think, let's see, we have two today. I'm going to call our first one, and I want to thank you for being here. Bill Dawson. Bill, are you here? Yes. Come on up, Bill, and tell us your story from the podium. Good afternoon, mayors. Is this working? Yeah, there we go. Council members, distinguished guests, and everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here and speak to you today. My name is Bill Dawson. And before I go too far, uh, somebody here has a stopwatch. And 
a video camera. So um, whoever has the stopwatch, uh, there's going to be a four-minute phone call for you in the hallway outside. So go make that phone call because I'm not going to talk for just three minutes. Okay, um, Denise was my spouse and was an award-winning pediatric RN. We were married in 1996, and six months later, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. We lived east of Temecula in the wine country, just before the road ended and you fall off the edge of the earth. After her first mastectomy, we settled into a routine of trips to the Orange County for chemotherapy and scans. Then came the second mastectomy, which was done prophylactically, which meant more trips to the OC, both surgeries and all of her reconstruction and care were done at St. Joseph's Hospital in Orange. We enjoyed the freeways so much we decided to go to the City of Hope in Doherty. Not once, not twice, but multiple times. To say that Denise was special is a tremendous understatement. With her 25-year nursing background and her caring personality, she was an excellent advocate for herself as well as countless others. During her illness, I was her caregiver. Moreover, the bonds that were formed at Michelle's place and all that it had to offer was crucial to both of us. Michelle's place will forever hold a special place in my heart. She finished her chemo regime and received a good bill of health with the standard five-year good luck wave off. Then it happened. In 2004, she was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. Of course, at that time, she's stage four. Back to the freeways, to the other counties for health care. I had lots of time to think in the parking lots that we call freeways. I decided to write a book. I was going to title the book, Bathrooms Between the Wine Country and Irvine. Soon thereafter, I recalled that a second book was necessary that one was going to be called, actually it would be more of a pamphlet, The Clean Bathrooms Between the Wine Country and Irvine. Most of the time, Denise was too ill to drive. I'm self-employed and was able to blend my schedule around doing hard time on the freeways. Every trip to Irvine took an entire day. Every trip to the UCLA Medical Center was an overnight stay and a hotel adventure. 2014, Denise had her liver resection at UCLA Medical Center. Three months after her liver resection, we learned that her liver was peppered with new lesions. Once again, we prepared for the battle to save her life. Back to Orange County and UCLA for every chemo and test we could possibly find. August of 2016, Denise received conditional approval for inclusion into a clinical trial at Stanford University Medical Center. We had to collect just what you would expect, scans, reports, and most of all, those tissue samples. Getting those ordered and delivered seemed to take an act of Congress, slow to come. They had collected the tissue samples at UCLA during her 2014 surgery but they were stored at U USC, I don't know why. Each entity seemed confused as to where to go for the permission to ship the tissue to Stanford. I remember what became a complex issue of getting in touch with the right person so that we could pay the tremendous sum of $20 for the shipping of the samples to Stanford. It was a never-ending battle. What a stumbling block. Denise was required to cease her chemotherapy well in advance of her presenting at Stanford for the clinical trial. On our arrival in Palo Alto at the hotel, Denise became worse day by day. I had never seen anyone deteriorate that fast. What followed next can best be described as a Bermuda Triangle with a perfect storm. The day before she was to begin the clinical trial, her liver enzymes were again tested. We were saddened by the news. She was so far out of range that she failed to be included in the trial. What a blow. 
knowing that only two weeks earlier her numbers were in range and that we stopped her chemo in hopes of a new beginning. So close, but yet so far. We were both devastated. Denise had now been without treatment for at least a month. For the first time, we both knew that we had hit a brick wall. She had become wheelchair dependent within one week. Her family gathered and we all went to a nice facility. 15 days later, her time was up. I don't expect anyone here to leave the room, go out in the hallway and immediately start dialing 1-800-SEND-ME-A-BULLDOZER. But my message to you here today is, I believe that distance is proportional to time, which directly affects quality and ultimately survivability. We need to have the proper facilities in this beautiful Temecula Valley to serve our ladies with breast cancer and other serious diseases. I hope that what I have said here today has helped to illustrate the importance of this issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Dawson, for sharing your story with us. Our next speaker is uh, Jamie McNeese. Jamie, are you here? Yeah. Please come over up to the podium. Hi there. I am Jamie McNeese, um, and I am a cancer survivor, and I am a health insurance agent. So those two combined are double trouble. Um, when I was diagnosed, I'm not gonna lie to you, I was excited because I was going to get the, to use the product that I sold on a daily basis, and I was gonna get to use it and experience it from the inside, up close and personal, and see what the experience was like for someone with a catastrophic illness and how their insurance would work on their behalf. Um, it was a lot of fun. I, I cannot deny that I had an awesome, amazing, over-the-top, wonderful cancer experience. And I appreciate your thought of writing a book. I did write a book, um, and I'm gonna give it to three of the ladies here. I, and I titled it Beautiful Cancer, because that was my experience. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the culture of the doctor's offices that I visited. I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with Rancho Family Medical Group. Um, my cancer was bladder cancer, and I woke up feeling completely normal. I woke up one morning with one little symptom. My pee was a beautiful shade of pink. And although it was very pretty, I knew that something was not right. I was in front of a doctor by 11.30 that same morning because of the culture at Rancho Family Medical Group. Dr. Madrid told me I needed to see a specialist. I was in front of a specialist within a week. A week later, I was having tests, and at the end of that day, she confirmed that I had cancer. That's two weeks from start to finish. That's because I had a PPO insurance plan. I didn't have to wait for referrals. I didn't have to go through an HMO administrator. I didn't have to, um, I didn't have to see who was in network. I had the largest network of doctors available to me. So my cancer experience, um, I'm not comfortable with words like struggle and fight and cancer sucks and things like that. That just, those words don't resonate with me. So the words that I used in my cancer experience was, I embraced it, I leaned into it, I was gonna suck the marrow out of it. Um, my cancer was identified as being uh, what are the words, angry and aggressive. Those words definitely don't resonate with me. So I referred to my cancer as being outgoing, overachieving, ready for world domination. I could get around that stuff. Um, my son was my caregiver, he's 23 years old, and the stories that I could tell you um, would apparently make you both laugh and cry. Um, and, and a lot of that is, is in the book that I wrote. Um, once my cancer was identified as being angry and aggressive, Dr. Chrisell at Tri-Valley Urology looked at me and said, you need a radical surgery, we can do it, but not as well as they can down at UCSD Medical Center. Again, within less than a week, 
I had a face-to-face -face appointment with the surgeon who was ready to do my surgery in two weeks. My situation was I was not emotionally ready for what was going to come. Um, I am bionic, I like to say, from my belly button to my pubic bone because they kind of took out everything, put back in the good parts, repurposed some of my intestine, um, and now I am, I, my life is no, new and normal and wonderful. Um, I, the biggest thing I want to leave with everyone in the room who has not had cancer or who isn't dealing with people with cancer on a regular basis, when someone is a cancer survivor, you might think their journey is over, but it's not. One of the things that I have discovered that is on a consistent basis, even though I am now 18 months cancer free, I know that there's a possibility that the cancer can return. And every little pain in my side or every little headache, my brain immediately goes to, oh my God, what if? What if it's back? What if it's metastasized? What if it's moved? What if it's, what if it's relocated? To, and, and because that was such a, a serious question that com kept coming up, I decided to create an answer to it. And my answer is, if the cancer returns for me, then I will lean in harder, I will embrace it stronger, and I will dance with it faster and harder than I did the first time around. That's my story. So I do have books for three ladies that are very important to me. Jamie, you too, thank you for sharing uh, your inspiring story with us. Our next item on the agenda um, is uh, the CHNA results. Uh, Jenna, are you here? I know you're here because I talked to you a minute ago. The floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you all for coming today. I am very excited to share with you the, the results uh, of the study that we've been working on. So today I'm going to summarize just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we found in our survey because uh, if you had a moment to open the one that I sent out, uh, I believe I sent it on Monday, it's about 100 pages long. So this will be just, just the very tip. And to be fair, the last 20 pages are, are appendices, so it's really only 80 pages long, but I, I know you're all busy people and that's still a lot to read. So I'm gonna summarize the high-level findings and then talk about what conclusions we at HARC really drew from that. And then I wanna discuss with all of you what findings surprised you? What uh, would you like to explore more? What stood out to you? And then I want to talk about the conclusions and next steps that occur to you when you see these findings. Is there something I missed? What popped to mind for you that this should be our next step because this is an issue? After today, uh, after we have these discussions, I'm going to take uh, our fabulous subcommittees and, and various other volunteers and, and try to tackle some of these next steps and we'll report back on the progress of that in November. So, in terms of methods, this is pretty familiar to all of you. We uh, worked with the CHNA, which stands for Community Health Needs Assessment, the subcommittee, and designed these surveys. Um, so everybody had a chance to have input on what questions should be on there, um, what were unnecessary and causing undue burden on our patients. And we ended up developing two surveys, one for cancer patients, survivors, and their caregivers, and another for healthcare providers. We developed it as a primarily online platform. There was a few paper surveys, and the participant recruitment was via all of you. So thank you so much to all of you who helped us by sending it along to your contacts and putting it on your social media. It was absolutely invaluable, and thank you so much to Paul for, po for creating beautiful newspaper ads. Those are in the back in the appendix, so you should look at it. I was really amazed at what his team came up with in about 
20 minutes. It's a beautiful ad. Uh, we also did some Facebook ads to try to recruit people uh, from this area who might be online browsing and see this and want to tell their story. So once we took out everybody who didn't qualify, sadly there were a lot of people from outside the area who really wanted to share their experience with us, but we are interested in this region of Southwest Riverside County. Once we took out everybody who didn't qualify, our ending sample is 385 cancer patients or survivors and 148 caregivers. And you can see that uh, both sides tended to be female, white, and uh, in the 50s or 60s and fairly well educated. So first I want to dive into the results of the cancer patients and survivors. So the most common types of cancer among our participants was breast cancer, skin cancer, and prostate cancer. I suspect breast cancer is well represented because we had some fabulous recruiting through Michelle's place who really helped us get the word out. Most of the people who were responding to our survey were diagnosed early on in stage one or stage two. And there was about a quarter of our participants were cu currently undergoing treatment, while about 69% had completed their treatment. Interestingly, I know this, uh, this task force was interested in misdiagnoses. A full quarter of these pa cancer patients and survivors had been misdiagnosed at first. So I love that this follows Jamie's um, talk because one of the things we asked was about their, their cycle and how long this took. For Jamie, this took, what, two weeks <laughs> from start to finish. We had a huge range of responses. Some people, again, took a week to two weeks to begin treatment. Others took years. One person in particular took 26 years to get to diagnosis. So this was really a huge spread. But for the majority of our participants, this process from first thinking something might be wrong up to beginning treatment took about seven months. Only 6% of the people here had participated in a clinical trial as a part of their treatment. And I know that transportation and geography was a really big interest of this task force. We found that 26% had to travel 50 miles or more for their regular treatment. Regardless of where they got their treatment, the number one reason for why they chose that facility to get their treatment at was because insurance would cover it. So again, this goes back to the importance of having an insurance and having uh, healthcare providers here that take those insurances that are most common. Here in Riverside County, most participating patients were receiving their treatment at hematology oncology. Again, that's because Robin did a great job of helping us to uh, recruit, as well as Breastlink and Kaiser Permanente. Outside of the county, many are going to Loma Linda, since we all know it's a great Great Hospital, as well as UC San Diego. So we asked these cancer patients and survivors, what do you think are the top issues in cancer care locally? The first thing was the lack of accredited cancer centers. The second was the lack of specialized treat care and specialized providers. And the third was that high cost of treatment that we've talked about in so many of these meetings. We also asked what they would like help or assistance with. And the number one issue there was finding advice about community resources. Number two, going back to that finances, paying for treatment. And number three is applying for any benefits that they might be eligible for. Okay, so now I want to transition into talking about the caregivers that we surveyed. Most of these caregivers reported that they were caring for either a spouse or significant other, like uh, Bill's story, or they were caring for a parent. Um, many caregivers were that patient's only caregiver or they were the main caregiver. And the vast majority of these patients that they were caring for had no paid caregivers. So that meant that the entire caregiving team was volunteer. And as uh, Mike mentioned earlier, that can be really, really um, draining on the caregivers. We asked them what, typically, what are they doing in their role as caregiver? By far the most common was providing emotional support and encouragement. Nearly every one of our caregivers found that to be one of their roles. They also go to doctor's appointments with the patient, 
help out with chores around the home, and help with transportation, which I know we've discussed many times. We ask the caregivers as well, what do you think are the top issues and, and areas for improvement? And their answers perfectly paralleled what the cancer patients and survivors said. That was the lack of accredited cancer centers, lack of specialized care, and the high cost of treatment. We also asked, what services do you think would have been helpful for that patient to have? And I said, first and foremost, help understanding diagnosis and treatment options, followed by that advice about the community resources, which was number one for the patients themselves, and again, help applying for benefits. Most caregivers really wanted help finding information about additional resources that the patient might have been eligible for, like a transportation program or meals assistance. So again, here you really see that feeling that this is such a diverse and complex issue that uh, people want more information and they want to know what resources are out there to help support them. Next, I want to hit on some of the highlights from our healthcare provider survey. We asked our local healthcare providers, what do you think is the quality of local cancer care? And as you can see, it's, it's fairly varied. You've got uh, quite a few on the excellent and the very good, but you also have uh, a fair percentage on the uh, poor. And this last one, which is varies based on the patient's circumstances. We also asked them to talk about the avail availability. It's not the quality of care, but is there care here? And as you can see, it's fairly stacked in the middle. Average, a little better than average, a little worse than average. We asked them to elaborate on that. And if you look through the report, there's a bunch of great quotes that are pulled out. They're in sort of a teal color and, and larger font so that you can find them easily. But I wanted to pull out two here. Um, and, and they often represent some very differing perspectives. This one says, 90% of cancer patients can be successfully treated in our area with current state-of-the-art treatment options in both medical oncology and radiation oncology. Plus, we know our patients' names, and they see the same doctors and nurses every visit. Another perspective is there's not as much access to clinical trials here, and there are limited oncology surgeons and gynecological oncologists in the area. So those are reasons why there might be um, movement out. The majority of our local providers, 87%, have referred some of their patients out of the area for treatment. And the number one reason why they did that was availability of clinical trials. As we saw, only 6% of our local participating cancer patients and survivors participated in clinical trials because there's not as many locally. Other reasons are because there's more therapeutic options available outside of the area, and if the patient had, excuse me, a rare cancer type, that was also a reason to send them out. We asked providers what reason do you see, what a whole list of reasons why they potentially would see their patients not being able to get through treatment. What was interfering with the patient treatment? And the number one issue, again, reflected back to those discussions we've had about financial, financial resources that is getting in the way of patients completing their treatment. So these are just very, very tip of the iceberg, and I encourage you all to take a look at the beautiful um, infographic that my research associate, Chris, who's in the back, made. It's gorgeous. It's his first one, too. Really impressive for the first one. Um, and to take a look at the a whole report that was sent out on Monday. If uh, 80 pages is much too much, I completely understand. The findings are all summarized in the first four pages, so you can hit that up. Um, but when I looked at all of this, when I looked at all these results, here are sort of the next steps and the implications that came to my mind. These are also in the report. <clears throat> the first one is accreditation. This came up as the number one issue according to uh, cancer patients and survivors as well as for their caregivers. So I know this is a huge undertaking, and actually many of these are huge undertakings, but one way that would help us to keep our cancer patients here for treatment is if we had uh, a hospital that was accredited as a cancer center. The next one is clinical trials. That came up as the number one reason why providers were referring out of area, and the fact that only 6% of people were here were able to participate in a clinical trial. 
So exploring how uh, local providers can participate or maybe be satellite sites for other clinical trials. The other is the provider survey. When you look at that, that timeline that I showed, that seven months, we asked people who had to wait two weeks or longer in between each one, why did you wait? And the majority of them said there was scheduling issues. They couldn't get in any sooner. Um, there weren't enough providers. There weren't enough chairs uh, for, in terms of treatment. So this is something that we really do need more providers, especially in the specialty area. And so, as you all know, we had a great guest speaker last month or, the, or, or last meeting or the one before, uh, Sonia Jackson with the Riverside County Medical Association. And she was doing some great work already to try to attract more providers to our Inland Empire area. So I think we need to continue to um, explore what partnerships we can do with her, <coughs> excuse me, in order to attract more providers. Additionally, um, I do a lot of work in terms of looking at the primary care provider shortage uh, in our Inland Empire region. And one way to solve the problem, again, this is a really big step, it's not an easy step, uh, but is to establish residency programs. Typically, uh, with a residency program, they're about three years, and your MDs are going to come in and serve the residency program. They do see patients for those three years, and you get an additional, usually the first class is eight residents, you get an additional eight every time. But the really exciting thing is most of them stay, the data that I have is in relation to family medicine practice, which is not necessarily the same as the specialists we need, but it, it's a very interesting um, uh, statistic, and I think that uh, specialists will closely mirror that, is you get about 40% of the people who do their residency end up staying and living and practicing within 25 miles of where they did their residency. So if we want more providers to practice here, we need to not only attract more, but also to have residency programs so we grow our, grow our own. The other conclusions that um, jumped out to me is first thing about communication about resources. So many times, you know, that was the number one need uh, that was identified by cancer patients and survivors was they wanted to know more about what resources are out there. And that was identified as well with the caregivers. So one of the things I think that should be next up for the, the task force is to maintain a nice comprehensive list of resources, and it's tough because there are lists out there, but they get outdated really quickly. They need to be updated quickly, and we need to make sure that that list itself is findable because <laughs> that's the trouble with many of these resources is that there are stellar resources out there, but it's just difficult to find them. The next one we've talked about quite a bit, um, and we actually have a subcommittee dedicated to this, but developing a foundation. The Recurring theme came up time and time again that finances, while not the number one issue, are definitely an issue. There's a high cost of treatment, and patients need help in paying for this. We have talked in the foundation subcommittee about um, the initial thought was we should form a foundation, and Michelle's place wonderfully stepped up to the plate and said we'd be interested in, extend, in instead expanding, because let me tell you, uh, that's a lot easier than starting your own 501c3, which, again, is a big, big undertaking and will take years. So uh, one of my conclusions is that we should continue our work on the foundation subcommittee to talk about how that might work, what it will look like, and how we can develop the funding to financially support that because it's not on their budget, and we need to figure out a way to make that actually a sustainable option. The last one, um, we'd asked people about their existing sources of support, and many of them, most of them in fact, said, I get all the support I need from my friends and my family. I don't need any additional support. We asked, did you get help with these various things like transportation, like um, chores around the house? And yes, 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 I got help, and it was from my family or my friends. It came out again and again and again. How did you get to your treatment? My family or friends drove me, which is amazing. This it indicates that there's a huge network of care, caring people who are doing a wonderful job. But if you are a person who is diagnosed with cancer and you don't have many close friends or family in your geographic area, 
who's doing all of those things then? So again, while it's not the majority, it certainly is a population that needs to be addressed, and we need to think about what resources are already out there for these people who don't have those built-in support systems, and how can we connect them to those resources. So, that being said, I didn't want to overwhelm you with too much data uh, so that your eyes glaze over, but I want to know what findings really stood out to you, either from the presentation or from the full report or from the infographic. What stood out to you? Is there anything that surprised you? And then let's talk about those conclusions and next steps. Do you agree with the ones I, I said? Do you disagree with them? I'm open to that. And then are there any that jumped out to you that you see this finding and you say, wow, this is a really clear next step to me? Um, because obviously I'm not the end all be all and most of you have a lot more um, experience in direct care than I do. So with that, I'd like to open the floor if anybody wants to. Yeah, um, Jenna, you go ahead and, and you, you conduct. I'm going to sit back here. Okay. And um, I know we have other people who, not are, or who are not at the table. We may want to ask their yes. opinion as well. And I think Mr. Gibbs had something to say. Uh, thank you. She did a great job. Uh, first question is, uh, when you sent out the report, it was labeled draft. So is this a final? That is a very good question. So one of the things about the way that HARC works is we're always very collaborative. I am very open to you any and all of you taking a look and asking for an additional analysis or questioning um, my interpretation of a finding or anything like that. Uh, we will close the opportunity for you all to give feedback next Friday so that we can make a final draft. But I do want that opportunity for any of you to contribute and to give your input. So in the meantime, it's an interim final. <laughs> can, can we use this as a public document? I think that that's up to the task force. I'm certainly willing. It is copyrighted of yours. And if you want to use it, I am all for it. I would like to hear if anybody has any issues with that. Rick, I would say if you think you have a need for it, go for it. OK. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I, I, I can use it uh, right away. Beautiful. Um, one, one of the things that struck me is uh, the findings are probably pretty much in agreement with what most of us really think. Um, what, one of the things I would say about you know, the, the thoughts of medical providers is you know, each one of you is talking for your own hospital, your, your own practice, and you're very confident that you can provide the care that's required. But yet, <laughs> when you look at the large number of folks who refer outside, and it doesn't matter for what reason, it really s speaks to the fact that <clears throat> while individually we are really good, collectively we are remiss. And one of those recommendations about uh, accreditation, about uh, growing our own and getting more oncologists, certainly in the area, and uh, <clears throat> expanding practices, th that's probably well taken. But, but also part of that recommendation was for all of you in the medical profession, th that if you're really doing as well as you hope, and you have your own metrics for that, you've got to get the word out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you know, can cancer is not something that you just tout and say, hey, guess what, I'm the, I'm the best cancer guy around. But the citizenry, uh, the potential patients that exist in this region, they need to know that there's a place that they can go and, and reasonably be assured that uh, they are going to be get the best cure available. They don't really have to drive to San Diego. Now, I'll give Loma Linda, a, a, one of your docs, a, uh, a kudo because after my wife was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, he just said it point blank. You've had six prior surgeries, abdominal surgeries at UCSD. You're a minefield. You know, when you're discharged from here, I, I recommend you go back to UCSD. Otherwise, I, I, the risk of me doing the surgery would be increased dramatically. So, anyway, uh, by the way, I'm, uh, I didn't want to steal your thunder. I'm going to pass th these out. Uh, this is from The Economist. Uh, not everybody reads The Economist. But it's uh, 12 pages 
on targeting tumors. Uh, it's a pretty good rate. I'll have more to say later. But anyway, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, you know what? Um, it would help. Do we have a portable mic, Jonathan? We don't. <laughs> Uh, well, we're recording all this. So that's yeah, why it's so why important. don't you come up here, Jamie? Yeah. It's just always good for the video okay. to be okay. audible. So as, as a cancer survivor and a health insurance agent, I don't have any doubt about the capability of the hospitals in our region. I'm very comfortable with that. In fact, my first surgery um, as an outpatient was at Rancho Springs Hospital. Um, in by six, home by noon, it was wonderful. The experience was, I, it was a love fest. When they rolled me into the OR, um, the, the OR nurse happened to meet an acquaintance. She introduced me to everybody in the room, and then I went to sleep. It was wonderful. My care was wonderful. I, the, our hospitals are phenomenal. The thing is, when you have cancer, the first thing you do is start, you go to Dr. Google. Like it or not, that's what I did for two weeks until I had the diagnosis, and then again for as often as possible. And, I can't, and someone diagnosed with cancer, the first thing they're gonna Google is, who is the best frickin' doctor there is for what I have? And when I Googled that today, uh, what came up was how to choose a, a surgeon, how to choose a doctor. And what it says is to pick someone who has, who's do, who has done that procedure more than anybody else. So, personally, I don't think our issue is the hospitals here. I think our issue is that the, the guys doing it are down at Morris Cancer Center or down at Cedars because they've done so many of the surgeries. Or Amy's name comes up all the time. I mean, seriously, kudos to you. Um, so, when I see things like Rady's developing relationships with us in this region, if there was any way that we could have UCSD developing relationships with some of our specialists in this region, then we would have that direct access. The hospital isn't the issue, it's doctors that are doing that procedure more times than anybody else. Thank you, Jamie, and I, I agree with that online search. I know that's the first thing I do. Uh, Dr. Mendoza. Okay, um, here are my thoughts. Um, uh, number one, um, the study is really very limited because there were very few uh, respondents. But having uh, done it, I think that it's obvious what the thoughts are of the people who um, answered to the survey. Number one, Comprehensive Cancer Center, an NCI designated Comprehensive Cancer Center. And there are only 69 in the country. Mm -hmm. There are only available in 39 states. And they serve only 250,000 cancer patients per year. So obviously 90% of cancer care in America is given in the community. There is no way everybody can go to the Comprehensive Cancer Center to get their care. What is available in the community is what we call a COC certified um, cancer program. That's the Commission on Cancer, mm -hmm. which is being run by um, the um, American College of Surgeons. Amer American College of Surgeons. There are several levels of certification, but to get the certification is actually a very difficult process. You have to have a program that's been running for three years, and then you request a visit, and um, they will assess what you've done, and then they determine if you have passed, and then they will certify you. We have actually done that. Loma Linda University Medical Center in Murrieta had a site visit this week, and we are in the process of being certified. We're keeping our fingers crossed. We will hear in the next 45 days. I'd say that deserves a round of applause. She's tackling our next steps before they're even out of my mouth. It is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. it, it entails um, 
um, an administration that is determined to provide the resources and the dedication of several physicians. So um, we are trying our best to improve the quality of care um, and also the perception, you know. I, I think that as a community, as a, I, we, we cannot compare ourselves to an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. As a matter of fact, if you are research, uh, the goal of these places are for research, finding new treatments, so we need them. We need to send them the rarest cancers of all so they will find a cure for these cancers. So when your local oncologist says that you need to go to a tertiary care doctor or facility, that's for your own good and that's a good sign that your oncologist is not holding on to you when they think there's something else better out there for you. But having said that, most of the care really can be given locally and most of the oncologists um, locally also know what their limitations are and send you to a tertiary care facility when they feel that there's more for you that we can offer locally. And, and, and that's, that's a good sign. Yeah. Um, that's all I have That's to say. great. And you know, when, when you're talking about the COC accreditation, um, you know, when I was looking at, well, what does American Cancer Society, neither of our representatives were here today, but what did they say on their site about when you say, I've just been diagnosed with cancer, how do I select my provider? And one of the very first things on there is to find a COC because uh, something like 70% of all cancer treatment in the United States are done in COCs. So if we can have one of those, that would be phenomenal, I think. Yeah. I, I'd kind of uh, like to echo a little bit what Dr. Mendoza said. Um, there were a few things in, in the presentation I kind of thought, that's not really what I see and that's not what I read either. One of them was the, the I was surprised when I saw that on the top here was breast cancer. Though it is common, it pales in comparison to lung cancer, which didn't even find its way onto the list. So when I see a finding like that, and I'm familiar with the national data, that makes me wonder, why are we such an outlier? Or is there something, and, and, and maybe that was how a survivor was defined. Or is it a survivor defined as maybe five years plus? Because if they are, lung cancer is not so survivable in the long term as breast cancer, and that might be part of yeah. the study and the final results are reflected in that. So let me speak to that real quick. Um, you know, the, the first report that we did with the secondary data definitely comes out that, that lung cancer is very common in the United States and, and in our region as well. This was a convenience sample, so it was anybody that the task force could get recruiting. And because places like Michelle's place have so many breast cancer uh, survivors, they are the ones who helped us recruit, and so that's where you see that disproportionate amount. The other thing that you mentioned that is always a risk when you're doing these self-report surveys is absolutely survivability. We are talking about people who either currently have cancer or have been treated for cancer and are a cancer survivor, but those more lethal um, types of cancer are not uh, not represented because those people aren't alive to take our survey. Lung cancer is represented, it's just not in the top three. And in the full report, there is uh, a breakout for where it is in there. Um, another thing I wanted to comment on, you had mentioned about the um, transportation of, of mm -hmm. can cancer patients to um, to their different doctor's offices. And it, you know, I, and I'm, I do primary care. And I, I see the family member come along and it's like they're on the tour. It's like they're on, at Disneyland, except they're not rides. They're all doctor's offices. And they're going to all these different places. And, um, and I, can, I can also speak as a cancer survivor that my family drove from San Diego to Tucson to take care of me for a lot of my stay, for a lot of my treatment. And I see it, as, and I see it in my patients that I see Brother Joe flying from Connecticut or whatever, and it's a coming together a lot of times so I don't think that's necessarily a negative thing that family members are having to drive them to their office appointments. A lot of them, it is their privilege to be able to do so. 
Oh, just a different I, take on I, that. Thank you so much for saying that because, you know, that is one of those things which is why the report isn't final because that's something that never would have occurred to me and I would love to integrate that um, into it. I wanted to talk about the residency um, portion mm -hmm. of your recommendation. Um, we are pursuing a residency program at Temecula Valley Hospital. Um, and while I agree that's important, um, it'll really focus on primary care. Mm -hmm. It is a multi-year process. Uh, we applied about a year ago. We'll find out in January whether we've been uh, going to be granted that. And then it takes another year before you start. So this would start in 19. Um, but it really doesn't address the fact that I don't believe the study reflected really a shortage of oncologists or, or primary care. I think there are oncologists uh, in this area that can meet the need. I don't think we've done a great job, as, as Rick Gibb mentioned, about letting people know the resources that are, that are here in this area. And there are some specialists that are, that are lacking, as, as the gynonc that you mentioned. But outside of that, most of the services are here. I just don't think they're well, they're well known. They're well known. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that a residency program is is part of the solution uh, mm -hmm. of what we're seeing although it is being addressed i don't think it's specific enough to mm -hmm. to meet the cancer need that's a really good point and yeah the the only area where it really came up well a that everybody identified lack of specialty care as, as a major issue but uh, that that really came up in the delays you know and it may be that those are delays also that that it's a very complex inner working of number of providers and insurance, right? So if there's an insurance that a bunch of people have that there's only one provider that takes that insurance, then you come up against those delays. Um, but I absolutely agree that um, it's tough to toot your own horn. <laughs> we hear that a lot at HARC. And um, making sure that uh, it's, that's another reason why potentially having a great resource list that p potentially has a section for, hey, these are the local care providers, and look at all of their great credentials, all of their great experience. Please go see someone like this uh, for your treatment. They're in area. And raising that awareness is, is key to getting that in people's hands, and how do we get that in people's hands? So, so a little bit on that, on awareness. Um, we are a great Southwest Riverside county region and we are doing great things in this region we have Temecula Hospital Menifee Rancho Springs Loma Linda Kaiser's coming in bigger what might be helpful is I know that they all work on their own little marketing pieces but maybe something can come together regionally that we could have that sent out you know I I live in Menifee but I received the Temecula Hospital mailer, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so at, as we talk about this as a group, to, I know it, everybody wants to bring the attraction to their own facility, but we have radies coming in. You know, we're pulling them up from San Diego. Um, that maybe regionally we could do some kind of literature that really comes together and shows the big picture with testimonials, with s survivor stories. I mean, I mean, it can't be 80 pages, but <laughs> but it um, definitely could be a booklet yeah. that we work on as a group to come together regionally and really show what we have here regionally. I think that's a great idea, and I, I love the synergy idea. And honestly, like you said, um, this is a great place to come. Great and. David, when you were talking about, oh, you're getting to spend time with your family member that maybe you don't get to see, that can be a part of it, too. They're not going to be bored. It's fun here. <laughs> I love that idea. Well, definitely. Casey's taking all good notes, so I promise. While I'm not typing frantically, she is. I guess I'd like to suggest that even though Mike wants to wait until the end, that I think it's appropriate to talk about the results of the Autism Task Force and how you were able to get the word out for all our cities because I think it's relevant to this discussion. It, you know, uh, it, it's 
first of all, Rick worked very closely with me on that, and I was just about to bring that up, so I'm not surprised that you just brought it up. You know, we, um, we concluded the Autism Task Force with a resource guide. Beautiful. And, um, and what was real important with the resource guide was that it was um, currently updated all the time. And we allocated staff time here in Temecula um, we in Temecula didn't monitor whether or not that was going on in Murrieta or whether or not it was going on in Wildemar or any of the other um, uh, cities that joined the task force. We just left it up to them to do that. Um, I suspect some cities, just due to budget constraints or maybe you know not having a big interest, maybe just sort of let it fall by the wayside or maybe they referred people to Temecula's website. I don't know. Um, we also created a mechanism with that resource guide um, to um, continue to get the word out and allow people to become part of that resource guide. So we set up a, a criteria and a screening mechanism. And what I mean by that is um, somebody just couldn't call up and say, you know what, I'm doing um, a, a to Z therapy and I opened up in the shopping center over there and I'd like to be in your resource guide. Well, you know, there's a lot of junk science out there and, and you know, so we would have to vet it first. You know, what do you do? How long have you been in business? Uh, what are some of your results? Or, you know, what are some of your, 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 your studies? Who's, you know, all mm -hmm. of these things. And, and they'd have to pass our vetting process before they got in the resource guide. God forbid we didn't want to, you know, uh, 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 send somebody or refer somebody out to, again, something that was kind of junk science. Um, but I think, I, I know... I would advocate, and I like what you, you said, you need, you need some sort of resource guide, some sort of synergy mm -hmm. and collaboration that can be uh, uh, maintained mm -hmm. um, and uh, constantly updated. And my gosh, uh, what I've learned from working with all of you is that this is kind of a continually changing uh, environment. Um, and there's all kinds of different perspectives. You know, we've heard uh, from some that said, um, some of our speakers, there's no services here, to some that said the services here were great, you know, and, and, and you're wondering where's that disparity? Was it just, uh, and, and it's not just one or two, we do have factions that say, oh my gosh, I have to go to Orange County or I have to, you know, right. go to LA. Maybe it was the type of cancer. I, I, again, I don't know, but that collaboration and communication, I think, as our end result is really important. Then following through with the, um, with the uh, task force as well, is um, we, we were able to send our final document um, out to other agencies and just mm -hmm. say, you know, come on, yeah, which was one of the, one of the reasons um, from a city point of view, um, we were also going to use this aspect as a form of economic development. Um, not that we want to piggy piggyback uh, economic development on cancer, but from a city's point of view, that's what we have to offer is what can we what can we do to bring you here and if we need to provide incentives and tell you about our market and whether or not we're uh, um, uh, you know we're uh, we're oversupplied or undersupplied with treatment and things like that that's what a city can do and that that paid off dividends because um, something um, and I know uh, uh, Supervisor Washington because we've worked together on so many different task force and things that we've done um, we come to find out that a lot of people across the nation, and, and in a sense, uh, from an EDC point of view, economic development, but um, don't really know we exist out here. Mm. Um, we're kind of this, this region out here, and, and, and they don't really know that this is probably one of the fastest growing counties in the United States. And once that word got out, um, in fact, you know, uh, Temecula Valley Hospital built, Loma Linda built, all of a sudden, um, we're starting to see more health care providers come out here. Rady's coming out here. Kaiser came out here. Why? It's because the population base is here. The people are here. The need is here. So I think that's an important aspect. Uh, the resource guide and, of course, a mechanism to get the word out and say, here we are. We're Southwest Riverside County. And one last thing I want to say uh, from my point of view is um, uh, we've always started this effort, and in all of these efforts we do when we're collaborating, um, we do not want to cannibalize each other's cities. This isn't, you know, Menifee got a Kaiser and we didn't. It has nothing to do with that. Marietta got it. You got it. But, <laughs> but we have Menifee Medical Center. And, and, and you know what? If, if, if 
one of our citizens has to take a trip to Marietta or Menifee, that's just fine. Okay, right. we just want it in the region. Right. And of course, the jobs that come along with that and the economic development, that's fine if it's regional as well. And that's what I love about what Lisa was saying, the, the regional look, because it really is. Just because somebody seeks treatment in one neighboring city and then they drive five miles across the border to where they live, that's a great solution. So I wanted to respond to your um, resource guide. I forgot to mention, I don't know how I forgot this, that we do have copies of our, again, first draft resource guide that was on the front desk. And if anybody didn't get one, please pick it up. I'll also send it out to you. Um, this is a very, again, rough draft first guide. I'm sure there are um, resources I missed. So please be sure to let me know if there are. The second thing is that um, last week, Casey and I attended a great uh, workshop, well, conference on uh, geographic information systems and mapping at Esri in Redlands. And unfortunately, it was just last week, so I didn't have time to put this together for this meeting, but I'm really hoping to pull something together for our next meeting. They have a great functionality for making maps of resources that could be very region-wide, that would represent where our care providers are, where your support systems are, and have this map that we could embed, uh, you know, that we could put links on everybody's websites. So if you have been diagnosed with cancer, you can go to the map, you can scroll in, scroll out, you can click on, let's say, Michelle's place, and it'll tell you details like eligibility and hours that they're open and their website to direct you. Um, so I'd really like to, in addition to this printed uh, resource guide, to be able to develop something like that for you as well. Again, both of those need to be updated. As you mentioned, things get out of date really fast and it gets useless really fast. So we do need to think about how are we going to make that sustainable going forward? Where is that going? Where is that resource guide going to live? And who's going to be responsible for updating it and for doing that screening uh, that, that you mentioned when somebody wants to add a resource onto that list? So I'm, fingers crossed, really excited to potentially uh, share that resource map with you next time. Betsy? You mean American Cancer Association? Yeah. We use some of theirs. There's a little bit old, so again, right. updating. Um, but that's great news, and you know, in case any of you didn't hear what Betsy said, American Cancer Society, who are great participants on our task force but are not here tonight, they actually had conflicts, both of them, uh, has volunteered for them to be the home where this resource guide lives, which I think is absolutely a great logical place, and every city can link to that, which would be really exciting. Andrea? Again, yes, uh, I think the, okay, yes, I absolutely will. And again, this is the first draft, so if anybody, I'm sure I left out plenty, so if anybody sees gaps, do send them to me. Um, uh, uh, th just um, one other thing, I just want to point out a silver lining on, on what looks like might be kind of grim. The one really almost condemning uh, factor says, 87% of providers refer patients outside the area. Just, just a light on them. When I, when I noticed what the question was, and the difference in the wording of the question is a few words can make a huge difference mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the number of percentage you get. If you were to ask me, have I ever read, do I, the, the, the question was, have you referred out of the area? Well, of course I have. So the answer would almost always be yes. But if the answer, question was, do you refer out of the area? Or do you frequently refer out of the area? The answer would be absolutely not. And, and I have, um, of all the providers here, I have their business cards and I have their, phone, I have their cell phone number, and I think most of them have mine, and, I, and we are in pretty close correspondence. And so um, uh, we, uh, the, the effort is there, <laughs> and I think if, the, um, if you were to do a follow-up question, that would be the one I would do is, for the providers, is, have you referred out? Yes. 
how often do you refer mm. out? That's a really good point. And Casey, maybe you can look in, in the appendix that says exactly how it was phrased. Um, and I absolutely agree. Just a few words can change so much. And that's why, as, uh, as the, the subcommittee here was so invaluable in taking a look at how we were framing things and how we phrased them. And maybe Casey can take a look and tell you exactly how that's phrased. But I agree. And it also goes back to, I um, forget who mentioned it earlier, that it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? It's you know when they would be better off served somewhere else if they do have a super rare cancer or something like that. So absolutely, it's not, um, we need to be sure in the, the discussion, and Casey, write this down, um, that the way it's framed is not that this is necessarily a negative thing, that it could be either, honestly. Um, does, um, does the industry have a, uh, have a um, maybe uh, local conventions or gathering uh, uh, places in which um, they go to find out where are the, the emerging markets or underserved markets? Uh, do, does the healthcare industry have something like that? For instance, in the, in the commercial shopping center industry, would, would, uh, yearly or twice yearly, would they have the International Conference of Shopping Centers where, where uh, mostly in May, every city and every developer and every uh, retailer and everybody you can imagine by the, by the tens of thousands uh, go to Las Vegas all to swap ideas and look for uh, potential uh, opportunities to expand and build and cities are trying to attract people and, uh, and businesses are trying to find cities and, and, and so there's a place where they all go to collaborate. Does something like that exist in the medical industry? I'm gonna turn that over to perhaps Darlene. This, this section of the uh, task force would probably know better. I have a somewhat of an answer, but I think they have a more informed one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. Um, we look at it a couple different ways. One, we can see by, by diagnostic group um, so we can look at, you know, cancer versus stroke versus cardiac, orthopedic. You can sort it any particular way. In California, the data generally, uh, we just got the 2016 data, just to give you an idea of how long it takes to get current data that just came out last month. So it's, you know, it's already pretty, pretty dated, but at least it gives you an idea. And we can do the same thing by, um, by medical specialties. So we can look and see in this particular region, is there a shortage of general surgeons, gynecological surgeons, you know, whatever the category is, we do the same thing. Um, both Peter and I spend quite a bit of money each year recruiting physicians to the area. Mm -hmm. In order to do that legally, we have to demonstrate a community shortage and a community need. Mm -hmm. um, IEHP also has a wonderful program where they support physician recruitment and they're not under the same legal requirements that a hospital would be to make sure we're not inducing or committing fraud by doing that. That's why we look at the data pretty frequently is because we need to demonstrate legally that there is a shortage in the area uh, to enable, enable to recruit a physician to the area. Mm -hmm. Then let me, if I may, um, piggyback on that because years ago, uh, in particular, I think when we were working on um, doing a lot of work here in Old Town, we were, we were asking ourselves here in the city, um, what does it take to attract um, people in the high-tech industry, people in the uh, medical industry, people in the higher education industry. And so we, we commissioned studies by uh, professionals. Kaiser Marston comes to mind. Uh, Chuck, you'll remember this. And, and um, the, the feedback came back that said, well, listen, people who are in these industries, the surgeons, the, the, the doctors, the high-tech people, the educators, those that we wanted to attract to our, our community to, again, job creation and expanding that, that uh, sector, um, they wanted certain things. They wanted a, a standard of life. They wanted a lifestyle. So um, were we offering that here in, in the Inland Empire, here in the, in the Temecula Valley, Marietta Valley region? Um, down in San Diego, it's more of a metropolitan area. There's lots to do. I mean, when it's theater, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, dining out, things of that nature. Now, I ask this again. Is, is there some mechanism that we're, where we can find out what, what it is that would attract mm -hmm. those industries or those individuals here? Where are we missing the mark as cities? Well, D Darlene and I get the uh, um, 
benefit of meeting with a lot of physicians and talking to them. And I will say unequivocally, you know, this is a very desirable location. I think one of the things that keeps coming up in this task force is awareness. And so, you know, this, this community has grown dramatically over the last 10, 15 years. And I think one of the things when you share, you know, the different options for quality of life, you know, the, the police force, the educational system, it's very desirable. And so it's just, oh, a lot of the reaction I get is, oh, I didn't know this was here. So it's not that it's really hard to, I think, find physicians to come practice. In fact, once I get a chance to talk with them and, and we get to share, I think, and, and um, they're, it's very easy to get them engaged. It's, I think, more kind of the same thing about cancer, awareness of the options, awareness of the physicians that are practicing. Um, and that's here. So I think, I think that's the biggest thing we have. And, and you know, our, um, for those of you who weren't here last time when uh, Sonia Jackson spoke, that's, uh, you know, that's her entire job for Riverside County Medical Association is to bring that awareness. She's created a whole website for essentially, she, I think she described it, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I think she described it as match.com for hospitals and providers for the Inland Empire. Um, <laughs> and so I think it's a great time that we're talking about this, that there is also um, a person like Sonia whose whole job that is. And so that's why uh, one of the things that I think we really need to do is partner more with her and see, I, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that most of her partners are um, it, are physicians looking for a place, right? That that place where do you want to go practice, and then hospitals and 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 practices. I doubt that there's a lot of cities involved, and I think it would be really beneficial to have that extra picture because you're not always at work. What are you going to do when you're not at work? And I think you're absolutely right, especially in terms of cost of living. You mentioned San Diego is a metropolitan metropolitan area, but God is it expensive, and God is the traffic bad, and you know, you have all sorts of great things here that that certain people would really look for. And so I think we really do need to explore that partnership with Sonia a little bit more. And, and so, kind of following up on that, um, would it make sense? Uh, and and you know I don't I don't know how much your industry competes against one another so it's 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 hard to I, I don't know I don't know if you do at all and I don't know. Well, <laughs> yeah. So so I, I truly don't know. So but I I wonder does it make sense at some point again from an economic development point of view we know how to promote our cities every time we go to our ICSC whatever we, we're either doing promotional videos that tells you all about our city or what have you does it make sense for this group to, to have a, a, a promotional video or promotional literature that says, you know, Menifee, Murrieta, Temecula, Wildemar, Elsinore, this is an emerging healthcare market. We have, and, and you know, go on, you know, and, and Elsinore, it's dream extreme, you know, uh, uh, in Temecula, um, I don't know what we're using these days. I think it's, uh, uh, it is what it is, wine country. Uh, Do you want to know what they use in Idlewild? What? No. Uh, no, 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 okay. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so anyway, yeah. it, promoting this quality of life. Uh, not, we have entertainment, we have restaurants, we have Hawaiian country, we have, uh, um, we have the housing, uh, the various types of housing from, you know, single family, you know, typical track homes to estate homes. You know, a, a doctor who's making a couple million dollars a year, a surgeon or something, he's going to want to know, where, where am I going to live? I like La Jolla. You know, I'd like the hills, you know, out in San Diego, but where can I comparably live out here? Um, anyway, so that's my other question. Are we, should we collaborate in promoting ourselves collectively? I like that, Casey. <laughs> I have something. Yes. Went to the EDC thing today and here in Temecula at Pechanga, and it was a four-hour five hour, almost six hour <laughs> thing. But it was really funny because all their focus was on the quality of life and the big focus on all the videos was the hospitals. Mm -hmm. So we're trying, and those guys, Doug McAllister and those guys are trying to get the word out to try to absorb, to try to get those doctors to move here. Hey, there's hospitals right here. Where else do you have this many hospitals in such a geographic area so small together? I mean, I do work for all of them. I work for all those hospitals, so I know how close everything is. 
but it was interesting to see how they were selling it and they're pushing it out and that would be a way to once we get this thing set up give it to those guys to go out there when they're already marketing our area this would be a way to market for us to have this type of a thing down here and get more of those specialties they do say because we are geographically perfect in in california we are the perfect spot san diego to la to orange county we're in the perfect spot in this little valley and everybody wants to come and move here now and that's why everybody's having but it's going to be the draw if physicians know that we have the opportunities and it comes down to making money at the end of the day for those guys to be able to make a living at what they're doing right. and so we want to uh, get those guys so when we get this all together it would be a good thing to get with the edc guys and let them have a, a video or whatever that yes. we could come up with to show so they're out there in those markets. They had quite a few people from out of this area coming in here looking to build their companies and move here. So it was gonna be critical to get those type of economic development so when people know, hey, you, you can be treated here. <clears throat> I just went through the whole nightmare cancer. I got treated here in town, surgery, surgery at the finest five-star hotel in the world, which is Loma Linda, I mean, and the, the treatment was just impeccable. And I mean, the doctors are here locally, the surgeon was here locally, and they got me and cut me and did all those things really, really fast. So I'm one of those people that have survived the nightmare. But it's been, it's, it's needs to be out more and, and it would be awesome to have even more information out there. So if we could collaborate with those guys, the, with Doug and those guys, they can really make a difference and try to help recruit some of these young, talented people coming out. I think out that here. is such a great idea, Tim. And um, if you can connect me to the EDC people, I think now might be a good time to get them involved on that particular step. On So um, at our next meeting, if you would like us to invite our economic development directors, let us know that if okay. it's going to be directed towards them. Okay. Um, it might be more, uh, it, it might be good to have them there, but it might be more um, putting us in touch with them so that between now and the next meeting, we can get their input and their feedback on that particular it. step. You've got it. Dr. Hayton. As as a medical oncologist um, here in the community, I'm, I'm in the trenches every day. I see patients and my, my patient load is, is pretty busy. Um, and it's, it's very interesting for me to see these perceptions of the community that number one, access to getting in to see an oncologist is difficult. Number two, that um, in order to get quality cancer care, the perception is you have to go outside the community. Um, I can only speak for myself, and, and it's hard for me to see that without becoming deflated. Um, and certainly I don't want to become defensive because if that's, the, if that's the perception in the community, it is what it is, and that has to be changed. Um, anecdotally, I can say that whenever anybody comes through my door, you know, we, and I can think I can speak for most of the other oncologists here in the community that we provide recommendations. We're all board certified. That we provide recommendations that are, that are NCCN guideline approved. You know, we're not going out on a limb. We're, we're, we're all experienced. Um, not only am I not offended by somebody who wants to get a second opinion, I, I, I encourage them. I encourage them to get a second opinion, and the interesting thing is, is that I would say probably 95 to 98 percent of them come back to the community. But unless they get through my door to begin with, I nor anybody else gets that chance. And if there's that perception out there that you have to go to Dr. Google and, and go to the person who's done the most procedures. Um, and Mayor Gibbs, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that the state of uh, of a treatment for, for pancreatic cancer just within the past 10 years here in the, in the valley has, has improved leaps and bounds. There are pancreatic surgeons who will do whipples here that I would send my family to. And, and I'm not down on you, but that's, that's an example of the perception that in order to get that cancer care for a pancreatic cancer, you have to go outside of the community and that perception is what it is. Um, I think before we can move forward as a task force 
you know, and collaborating and, and sending it out to the community, I think that everybody here in this room needs to be convinced. Forget the community for the moment. I think that everybody in this room needs to be convinced that, that um, 95% of all cancer treatment can be done right here in the community and is state-of-the-art treatment and is the same treatment that you're going to get if you go to the ivory towers down south or anywhere else. What do they have to offer? Um, you know, there are some cancers that ought to be referred down there. And I'm not going to go into what those are, but I can, I can tell you that I and we know what those are, and we do get them down there. Clinical trials, is, is, it's easy to say, yes, let's offer clinical trials here, but that is a huge undertaking. It requires a lot of money, requires data managers and nurses and so forth, and we ought to get to there, but that wouldn't be a first step. But, but I do refer patients outward if they are interested in a clinical trial. Believe it or not, even though they say they're interested, once they find out about clinical trials and what it entails, they go, no, no, I'm just coming back to my oncologist here in the community. I don't want to have to drive to City of Hope or, or wherever it is for every single blood test and x-ray and CT scan and so forth. So I think that just as a, as a task force, I think that I guess I'm on a soapbox telling all of you that, that cancer care here in the valley is, is state of the art um, and, and it's, it's getting better and it's come a long ways just over the past 10 to 15 you years. You know, what you're saying there really sparks an idea for me for a little bit of additional analyses. You mentioned that Whipple surgeries now here are fantastic and that's an improvement that's happened in the last 10 years. I'm wondering, you know, we asked people, how long ago were you diagnosed with your cancer? And so we do have some data that we can look at, potentially, the people who are referring back to their experience, maybe it's 10 years ago, and the people who are referring to their current, this is what I'm going through right now experience. And I think it'd be interesting if we could pull that apart and see if there is a difference. And I completely agree that it's a, a huge issue is one of perception, right? If they had a bad experience, or they're parent had a bad experience 15 years ago, that's all that's stuck in their head. They're not realizing that these great advances have been made. Um, and that's something that we need to take into account when we're working on, you know, publicizing what a great place for treatment that this is. Yes. Um, thank you. <laughs> we can put it together even today. Uh, Excuse me, um, you were talking about putting together a kind of an information system which can be uh, supported by American Cancer Society, which could highlight the local resources and combine with certain statistical short studies where we can show that the rate of success locally compares with the more successful institutions. That is a great idea, because that is exactly the type of statistics that would be really compelling. Yeah, and um, like Dr. Hayton has been mentioning, yeah. that we want to also be able to say that the complication rate, sometimes we look at the complication rate of successful institutions and say, you know, our post-operative rate of sepsis and things like that is so low, and which is quite achievable locally and it is being achieved. So a, a kind of an organized way of putting together mm -hmm. um, our own capabilities could be the first step. I think that's a great idea. And the other thing that came out that you can see in some of the quotes is that is that personalized aspect of care that a couple of you have mentioned, you know, it, in that when they do seek treatment here, it is, uh, you know, Jamie was talking about, oh, they introduced me to everybody in the room. It was a great feeling, and we know our patients' names. It came up a lot. Um, so I do think that's another thing, in addition to these great statistics that Dr. Cholera is talking about, that sort of paint the other side of the picture. Is not only are we comparable or better on these, um, these metrics, but we also give you this above and beyond type of personalized attention. I, 
I hesitate. We, you know, we hear the good, bad, and the ugly of everybody in this room, to be honest, um, from the patient perspective. Um, a good out, when people have a good experience, it's because they survived cancer, right? They're going to complain when they haven't, or a family member has had a terrible experience. So um, I think a lot, you know, again, hesitating a little bit. I, there's not bad doctors. There's you know, not bad treatment. They've had a bad experience, and I think, well, I know cancer is a very personal journey, regardless of who you are or what kind it is. And I think there's a doctor for every one of those journeys as well. And maybe you're not the right doctor for that, or you're not the right patient for that doctor. Um, we get asked every single day, who's the best? Where do I go? And we can't do that. We're a resource center. We don't make recommendations. We give information. And we don't always have all the information, especially in all the doctors. There's a lot of doctors coming to town who only have office hours two days a week here because they're coming from San Diego, Orange County. I think testing the waters, they know there's a need, so they, they serve a couple days a week. But for the majority of the patients that, that come, or clients that come to us, they're mandated by their insurance, and they're not their best advocates. They don't do the research to see who else they can go to. They just go to whoever they're told to go to. And I would love to see more collaboration between our doctors to let each other know what you guys are working on or what you're doing, instead of just the basic, this is our standard of care. You're going to come to me, and I mean primary care doctors a lot of times, they just refer to the same oncologists or the same doctors. They're not exploring the options in our community either, um, and what's best for that patient for their journey. And so I think knowing who's in town and who's serving whom and doing what um, would be hugely beneficial for people like us so we can give that information out, getting to know who those people are, the doctors, physicians, oncologists, surgeons, so I know who those people are would be hugely beneficial for us as well and for our clients to give them the, the best options, helping them be their own best advocate. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jen. Okay, I know it's getting late, and I don't want to hold you all late. So uh, what I'm going to do next, Casey's been taking fabulous notes. You'll all have the meeting minutes within a week. Um, and as always, you know, take a look, review. If you hadn't have... If you have not had a chance to review the report and this piqued your interest, please, please do. If for some reason you didn't get it, shoot me an email and I'll send you one. Um, so we're going to take a look at everything that's been said today, work on some next steps, and we may be in touch with all of you, uh, asking for your assistance on various aspects of it uh, that you've discussed here today. And we will be reporting back out on that in November and talking about what we can do to make this a sustaining uh, sustaining effort that will really help the community beyond the, the life of this task force. Quick question. Yes. So um, we're meeting again in November. Is that the plan? That is correct. And then I think after that, uh, we'll conclude in, what, February? Was that the plan? November is the official conclusion. Right. Um, and we can definitely discuss if we want to, uh, if you all are willing to, to extend that. I can certainly say that this will be some very baby steps. Uh, that we're talking about now, and uh, I, I could see the benefit of continuing on a little bit further to follow through on some of those steps more. What I'd like to charge the group with is that um, we getting your work input and the work that you've done was fantastic. Um, we're going to need to... Yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. And, and along those lines, I uh, want to thank every city and, and everybody who helped contribute uh, raising the funds to, to, to hire you to do this. Um, but if we don't come out of here with some sort of decision making and work product, then, then you right. know, we just spun our wheels and got some good information. So I'm going to charge everybody that come November on our last meeting, I want to make some decisions. Um, are we going to do a video? Are we going to do a resource guide? And then if the answers to those questions are yes and yes and anything else, then the next logical steps are, okay, how are we going to do that? So it very, may very well need to be extended one or two more meetings um, in order to start those actual work efforts. Yes, and that is part of our work product is that you will have a, a lovely... Um, 
list of these, these next steps, all that you have contributed, and if anybody had some that they didn't get to talk about today, shoot me an email and they'll be included, and talking about what it will take to enact each of those Beautiful. and getting as far along on each of those as we possibly can in the next month. Got it. Thank you. Lisa, did you have anything else you'd like to close with? Yeah, you, um, you just, you would like us to send you our economic development director for our cities? That would be great. Or Information? If, uh, do you have a, a region regional one that's appropriate? Actually, um, Betsy, can you handle that? Betsy will get you all the names and Perfect. contact numbers and get it get it to you. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Dr. Mendoza, do you have a, a last comment? I was just curious if we have any progress in the subcommittee for the foundation slash expansion of Michelle's place, Kim? Yes, so um, there there has been some work and uh, we will be calling a subcommittee meeting before our November one, so you'll get a call and we will move that forward as best we can and report out to the broader task force on the progress. And we didn't talk much about that, um, but uh, one of the key issues that came up was financial. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, I think we're gonna need to talk about that at our next meeting, and I think that's a key component. Uh, Mayor Gibbs wanted to conclude our meeting. <coughs> well, it's not that I wanted to conclude the meeting, I just wanted to <coughs> read to you very briefly, and this is promising. Uh, <clears throat> this is from the Les Garden Foundation. Last spring, in an unprecedented fast-track review, the Food and Drug Administration approved Pembrolizumabab <clears throat> monoclonal antibody as the first immunotherapy treatment for advanced pancreatic cancer patients whose tumors have a unique mutation called mismatch repair deficiency. It alters their capacity to repair DNA <clears throat> this drug is the first cancer drug based on a predictive cancer marker rather than tumor type to be approved by the FDA. And I would say that the message here is that with Dr. Gottlieb in charge of the FDA, things are going to move faster, which is important to, for all of us. Thank you. Um, you. You folks are an amazing group, and I want to thank you all for the efforts and your personal time that you've put in thus far. And I think by the time we're done with this effort, we'll, we'll, we'll be glad that we did, and also the people that we serve will be glad. Um, if there's nothing else, I'm going to wish everybody a good evening. Okay. Take care.